About two weeks ago, I decided to add 10 gig wired ethernet to my house. I'm thrilled the work is done now because it was a horrible job. I hated doing it and I made lots of mistakes along the way. The good news is I can now save you from repeating any of those same mistakes. When I spoke to people before I started this, most people thought I was nuts. Like, why not just use Wi-Fi? Was it about the coverage? It wasn't the coverage. I've managed to sort that problem out with a, a mesh Wi-Fi with a, a set that I got by a company called Tender, um, and that solved that for me. It wasn't about the coverage. It was principally about dependability, um, but more so it was about the latency. So here's the comparison numbers. This is what it looks like um, running with Wi-Fi if I ping Google. And then this is what it typically looks like when I'm pinging Google with the wide ethernet that I've now put in. I'd say on average, it's about 40 to 50 milliseconds better with wide ethernet than it was with Wi-Fi. And some would argue that that's not enough to be worried about, but they're wrong because it is enough to worry about. It niggled me all the time and I'm glad I've eliminated that problem. The next thing you might be thinking is, why don't you just use power line adapters? Well, I've tried power line adapters, and these are pretty good in a pinch. If you have only need, say, a couple of these around the house, they're not bad at all. They certainly solve the latency problem. However, they're no good if you have three or four of them in a house, which is what I needed. And I've also found out that they, that the more you add, the worse the performance of those things get. But also, if you switch on a noisy appliance in your home, like a washing machine or a tumble dryer, the performance of these things just drops through the floor. So ultimately, that left me with Ethernet. So the latency problem can be solved just as easily by installing one gigabit Ethernet. So why bother with the newer 10 gigabit Ethernet? Well, I'm creating lots of content at the minute, like this, YouTube and video courses, and I wanted a way to back up this information that I'm creating. And something like a single backup disk attached by Thunderbolt or USB is just too flaky and problematic. So that led me to think about a RAID-based piece of hardware. Um, and then in turn, that made me think, well, if I'm going to the trouble of having a, a RAID-based piece of hardware, I may as well stick that on a network so that other people in the family can use it and I can access it anywhere and I don't necessarily need to have it in this office with me making a whole bunch of noise if it's particularly noisy. And to do to have something like that that's quick enough to use with video files, you will want to have something that's got 10 gig Ethernet so it's fast enough to deal with video files going back and forth. Now you'll have your own reasons for why you want 10 gig Ethernet and they were mine. So let's get on now and look at bits and pieces that you would need to install this on your home and principally that's a 10 gig capable switch, the right cabling, and the right connectors. As of right now, in like May 2021, there's not an awful lot of affordable 10 gig capable ethernet switches. Typically the ones that you can find that aren't a bazillion pounds have only got a, a couple of 10 gig ethernet ports. This is the one that I ended up with, which is the, the Netgear Nighthawk which is frankly a ridiculous looking piece of hardware. It looks more like a, a stealth bomber than a switch. Um, and I only got it because it was che cheaper than the others. I picked this one up for about £125 um, on Amazon, whereas the other sensible looking ones were sort of 150 160 And this was just going in the loft, so I didn't really care that it looked ridiculous. Um, it's actually quite a nice bit of kit, but you can see there even, um, from this on the back that you've got these two 10 gigabit ports and all the rest are standard 1 gig Ethernet and that's typically the way that most of the affordable switches you can get all of at the minute are set up. You get a couple of 10 gigs and the rest will be 1 gig or maybe even a couple of them will be 2.5 gig. Now the other option that you've got if the thought of having an expensive switch that's only got a couple of 10 gig ports on there seems ridiculous to you. What you can always do is wire the house with 10 gig cabling, 10 gig capable cabling, um, put a standard one gig switch in there, which are cheapest chips, and then down the line, you can always switch the switch out with a 10 gig version. Um, 
the, the cabling that works for 10 gig works just as well for 1 gig, it's backwards compatible. The next question you'll hear is should you use CAT6 or CAT6A or CAT5E cabling? CAT5 and CAT5E is the typical network cabling that you'll see everywhere. Virtually everything uses CAT5 or CAT5E. This is CAT5E cabling, or CAT5 actually, I think that was just standard CAT5. You can see the sort of comparable width of that. You've then got CAT6 there in the middle, and then this chunky boy here is CAT6A. I'll save you a lot of time. Get the CAT6 cable. Don't worry about the CAT6A and forget about the CAT5E. You can probably just skip ahead to the next part now if you're not interested in why. If you are interested in why, I'll tell you a little bit about that next. I needed to do, around my home, I needed to do three lots of two cable drops. So a total of six ports, but two in each network switch. So basically, on the wall, I'd have, I've got three of those around the house with, with two cables going into each of these switches. And having read the specs for the different cable, and I'd convinced myself that I needed the CAT6A just to be on the safe side. I went for two as opposed to just a one socket one because if you're going through the absolute hell that is running cable through your loft or down walls, you only want to do it once, so you may as well put two cables in. So in this home office, I've got both my personal Mac Mini and my work MacBook 16 inch connected directly with ethernet. Well, I say connected directly because it's a MacBook Pro, um, it's actually connected to about 18 dongles in order to get something as um, exotic as a, an ethernet cable connected to it. But theoretically, it's a direct connection. I blame Johnny Ive. Now Cat, Cat5, Cat6, Cat6A, six, six all use a standard RJ45 connector. Where they differ is in the, the thickness of the cable that goes inside them and, and how that cable is insulated and twisted. Cat5 is about 5.5. Cat6 is about 6.14, and old fatty is at least sort of 7.5. The reason Cat6A is so much thicker is because if I just remove that outer sheath there, you can see that alongside this sort of ground cable that you also get, each twisted pair of cables is individually shielded. So obviously down the run of the whole cable, you've got that foil around each twisted pair compared to, um, let's just take the sheath off this. This is cat six. And you can see on this one, it doesn't have the, you still got the twisted pairs, but you don't have the individual shielding around each twisted pair. And there's no ground cable. So, and it's got this plastic separator in the middle. So that means that that is not only thinner, but also heck of a lot more pliable. Plus the cables themselves in these foil things in the CAT6A are also quite a bit thicker. Um, and with the 6 and the 6A, you can tell the difference if you look down the end of the RJ45 connector. Although in terms of the network plug, these are exactly the same. If you look closely at that connector, you can just about see that all those cables inside are all in a straight line compared with that one which is on a bit of cat6 cabling can you see how they're staggered and that's how they managed to get these connectors backwards compatible so cat6 an easy way of telling cat6 cabling if you've got the connector on it is by that staggered up and down of of the eight different wires in there so the 6a is thicker better insulated and that means it can carry 10 gigabit data far further and at higher frequency than the CAT6. However, the downside is this stuff, although it doesn't seem that much thicker, when you're trying to get that down through wall cavities or through holes that you've drilled in walls, it's like, like the thickness of a baby's arm trying to shove that down the side of the wall is, is really difficult. I mean, shoving the cable down the side of the wall, obviously not a not baby's arm, that's just weird. I also think it's worth pointing out that over a short enough run you can get 10 gig speeds over just Cat5e but not over longer distances. 
what you're getting with these thicker cables and better insulated cables is the ability to send that same data further and further with less packet loss. Unless you live in a mansion, in which case, I don't know why you're watching this because you get your, your electrician, your, your network man to install this for you. For mere mortals, Cat6 is going to be absolutely ample because you can have up to 55 meters, it's rated for up to 55 meters of 10 gig, which is more than enough for any runs that you're likely to encounter. Um, I bet the longest length I used in one single bit was maybe maybe 20 meters, probably more like 15. So Cat6 was absolutely fine for my needs. If you do have one spectacularly long run that you need to do, you can mix and match. So you could have, I mean, I ended up with three Cat6A cable runs and three Cat6 runs. And they all work fine within the same network. There's no problem mixing and matching those. One more thing to be aware of if you are using Cat6A, less so with Cat6, is where it comes to terminating inside your, your network socket. The first couple of, um, the first socket I did with two cables in it, I couldn't understand why one of them wasn't working. And I tried cutting the, the connector off, redoing that again in the loft, coming back down, checking these connectors, these all looked okay making sure I'd got the you know, the, the right cable to the right little connector thing in here. Um, and it turned out, it was just because the, the wire was so thick, the, the little teeth in here that are supposed to cut through the insulation and attach to the copper, um, it was just too big. So it wasn't actually penetrating through the insulation. So what I found I had to do with the Cat, the cat 6A is once I've stripped off the outer, um, the foil, on the actual individual wires, I had to strip those a little bit as well before shoving them into these connectors. So if you have a similar, you know, you're going for a similar setup, be aware that that's a problem you might need to come across. It, I don't think that's the, the ideal way of doing it, but I ended up with all the, the Cat 6A connections doing that same thing of snipping the wires a little bit, stripping them rather, and shoving them in there. If you can make out the, the, the outside coring, is for 568B and then the inside it shows you the pins that you need for 568A. You might be wondering what on earth I'm talking about. There's two ways to, there's two standards to wire up these RJ45 connectors. One's called 568A, the other's called 568B. Again, I'm going to save you a lot of hassle, just wire it up as 568B. Do that on all your cables and all your connectors. That's the, the standard that's in North America and it's likely the same standard that everything you already own is wired up as as well. Another important point when you're buying your wire, make sure that you're not buying something that's labeled as CCA. CCA is copper colored aluminum, which basically means that the, the core of the actual wire isn't proper copper. It's just cheaper aluminum that's been dipped in copper. You want to avoid that at all costs because it's inferior cabling and is more likely to give you poorer performance. So to summarize with the cabling, get Cat6, get full copper, make sure if you're gonna run the stuff outside it's rated for external use. Don't worry if you need to mix and match Cat6 and Cat6A cable on the same network, it's fine. But if I was doing it all over again, I would save the money because Cat6 cabling, roughly half the price for a comparable type of cable as Cat6A, I would have saved the money and just done it all with Cat6. You wouldn't think the subject of the connectors for RJ45 and Cat6 cables would be worth their own little section, would you? Well, you'd be wrong because the first set of connectors I ordered to attach to the end of these cables were horrendous. Because of the thickness of Cat6 and Cat6A cabling, you simply couldn't get the wires down the end. So these are the sort you want that come with this little cable guide and you can just make out there the staggered nature of those so what you do is you strip your cable you push your cables through each of those holes in the right order and then once they're in position you you get your your crimping tool snip the ends off so there's just like two or three mil left of the cable poking out of this guide and then with the cable and the guide you shove that into the connector there push the cable right in little pro tip as well when you're shoving cables in, because they are tricky to get into place, I found that 
if I've got a torch, shine it over the end of the connectors and you can see, hopefully, that the copper for each of those wires is in place and you should have the eight cables staggered like that and obviously in the right order. Now obviously every, every house is constructed differently so I'm not going to go into the particulars of what you might need to, to get the holes through your walls and send cables through your loft and all the rest of it, but there are a few tools that I think are absolutely essential if you're attempting this job regardless of the construction of your home. If you haven't already, get yourself a set of these fiberglass rods. The fiberglass rods are great for getting cabling down the side of the house or through walls. This kit I got from Amazon, fairly inexpensive, came with a bunch of stuff I'll never need but some of the stuff is absolutely indispensable. You absolutely need one of these to crimp your cables and the other one that I thought was a bit, a bit much at the time was a cable tester. So these kits come with two parts and this bit typically slides off. So this bit here has a battery in the back and you switch it on and it sends a signal down to the other end and it will tell you whether you can see the one to eight on there and the ground, you're only bothered about one to eight. They'll light up as it tests each of the wires in your connection. So this has got RJ11 and RJ45. I'm obviously using RJ45. So here's a, a cable that I know doesn't work just to show you what happens. So that's what a cable or a, some sort of connection looks like when it doesn't work. And it, it might not be those particular order of lights. Let me show you one that does work. So this is what one looks like that does work. So you can see there, going down the numbers, and if it's going too quickly for you, they typically have a, a slow button as well, which is the same thing, just a lot slower so you can see the individual ones. I haven't found that necessarily if a particular number lights up that's the pin that's actually wrong. You just know that there's something wrong with the connection you need to go and check them all. So the good thing about that is not only can you test individual cables but once you've, once you've made a cable up and you know that the cable's okay you can plug the, the cable then into your network point and wherever your switch is plug the other end into the switch and then test that whole run in one go and find out if like there's a problem with your network socket or the, the plug that's connected into your switch. The only other tools in there that have been really useful are this sort of thing which lets you shove the wires and these sort of things and it's got, a, it's got this tool which is exactly for that purpose of, I can't remember how it goes now, you basically shove that down the gap and not only does it put it in the right place it cuts the end of that bit of wire off as well. That whole kit was like 16 or 17 quid, it wasn't a terrific amount but obviously very very useful. So I put off doing this job for about three years if I'm honest, not necessarily the 10 gig thing but the whole ethernet around the house thing because I knew it was going to be a complete pain, it was a complete pain. But the speed and responsiveness that you get from wired ethernet is unbeatable to me and I, I noticed the difference straight away so I'm absolutely thrilled it's done now. One thing that does really irk me is that I got a Mac Mini just before Christmas to do this whole video editing nonsense and at the time you couldn't order it with a 10 gig Ethernet port. You can now, which is a right kick in the teeth because the, the upgrade from Apple is about £100. An external 10 gig Ethernet dongle box thing is about £150 at the minute and you have to get one that uses Thunderbolt so not only is it more expensive it's also using up one of your Thunderbolt ports. It's also using up one of your Thunderbolt ports. If you just want the York Notes version of what you need to know, you need a switch that's got at least two 10 gigabit Ethernet ports on it. They're quite expensive at the minute, so one thing you could opt to do is wire the house with 10 gig capable wiring, stick a normal Ethernet switch in there and upgrade that bit down the line. The 10 gig wiring will work fine with a 1 gig Ethernet switch. If any of your cable runs are outside, make sure that you're getting cabling that's rated for external use. For Cat6 and Cat6A cabling, make sure you get the connectors that have got the little guides that you can shove the cables through first. It'll make wiring up of your network points and network cabling far, far easier. You can mix Cat6 and Cat6A cabling on the same network and it will be absolutely fine. It's all backwards compatible. With the really thick cabling like Cat6A, 
be aware that you might need to strip the individual wires a little bit when you're connecting them to your wall plate. Use the 568B standard. Forget about the A. 568B is what everything uses. Make sure you get yourself a network kit. Budget that in with the price of everything else. It's fairly inexpensive compared to everything else that you're going to buy but it'll absolutely make the job of troubleshooting any problems so much easier. If you are in the market for a new computer at the same time that you're doing this, try and spec in the, the built-in 10 gig ethernet port as part of the build, whether that's a Mac, a PC or whatever, just because it's an absolute pain to have another thing hanging out the back of your computer when you could have it built in, and they're typically cheaper if you can get them built in anyway. That's all for this one. Good luck getting your own 10 gig ethernet set up. I hope that was useful. If it was, please like, subscribe, get a tattoo, tell your grandma. If you've got any queries, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.